I'm sure, reduce the, the um, traffic between British universities and universities on the continent. I mean, European and continental writers may feel more inclined to come here to keep those channels open. To we have left the European Union, but we, we are still European. <laughs> Hi, welcome to Debates Digital, Adrian Taurdin. You're joining us from London, where you until recently were the French and Italian editor at the Times Literary Supplement. Today, we're going to talk about Brexit, but not so much about what we hear on the news every day, but rather about the consequences of Brexit for literature, for the publishing industry, and for culture in general. One could presume that an industry that, that exports about 60% of its product uh, 35 or so percent of that to the EU. One could presume that an industry that is dealing with copyright and intellectual, intellectual property across borders, an industry that is so dependent on input from the outside, from all sorts of talents, for example, writers, one could presume that such an industry will have problems now, at least initially when uh, Brexit starts to hit. How is it, Adrian? Are we in trouble? Um, well, thanks for, very much for having me, Carl and Henry. What I hear is that we're, um, things haven't changed very much and um, that the usual channels continue unimpeded. Um, of course, these are early days. I mean, we've been out of the European Union for just over well, five weeks, roughly. Uh, but um, I hear that you know, things, things will carry on as, as before. I mean, there are no tariffs to be imposed on books and journals. Um, uh, uh, an agreement was reached on the 24th of December 2020 with the European Union. Um, and uh, let's just hope that things can carry on. Um, I mean, for instance, next week, the Society of Authors will be handing out its annual um, translation prizes, um, and this this has been going on for for two or three decades now. I mean, they've added prizes over over time. They started with French and German and um, uh, and uh, Spanish, and then they've added other other prizes for other languages. So that's a good sign. I mean, that 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 will continue. And I think I mean, as far as from what I hear from publishers. Uh, Translators, translations continue to be commissioned, um, especially from the smaller publishers, by the smaller publishers. And these these will uh, appear over the course of time, over the next year or so. Uh, but then I guess we, we, we should have to wait and see whether things things have been affected uh, adversely by Brexit. Let's hope not. It's, it's, it's such a crucial part of the interchange between uh, cultures and nationalities in countries. There is, yes it is, and it's a, it's a very crucial part of it. And uh, there is of course a little bit of a one-way traffic uh, when it comes to English and all the other languages. Uh, do you think that this will now uh, change? Because, uh, I mean, some channels uh, uh, between the UK and continental Europe will become much more difficult to hold open. Uh, after Brexit? Well, I hope not, but I think, um, I mean, there's so many good enterprising small publishers that focus on uh, literature and fiction and poetry in foreign languages, and um, they may not, they're not necessarily based in London, they're quite, often, they're quite, quite a few of the regional, and um, they, now they're up and running and they're producing good work, I don't see any reason why they shouldn't continue. Um, there may be more paperwork, more bureaucracy, uh, more obstacles in the way, but I think if they're committed and engaged, which they clearly are, and there's, a, there's an appetite for this uh, literature, um, there, there, there clearly is. Um, I think I don't see any reason why, why that shouldn't continue. I mean, in spite of the fact that we, we have left the European Union, but we, we are still European in, in other respects, I think. Yes. yes. And another issue is, of course, not the movement of ideas uh, uh, in form of letters, for example, but uh, also uh, as persons. 
You have book fairs. The London Book Fair is a is a big, uh, important event in the publishing industry. The Frankfurt Book Fair on the continent uh, is another example. Uh, you have literary festivals all the time where writers are uh, getting a chance to meet their readers. Uh, do you think that this will be uh, influenced in any way? Um, well, again, I, I hope not. But I mean, it's, it's hard to tell. We can blame a lot of things on uh, on the pandemic, and I think that's. Um, Uncertainty surrounding those uh, events is, is certainly something which um, it's hard it's hard to hard to see where, where, which way that's going to go. I mean, obviously, these festivals are not taking place at the moment, or they they are they're taking place virtually. So it's it's not a proper gauge of how things will be when if and when we return to normality, because it obviously involves people moving around and people traveling and invitations going out and being accepted and I suppose there's a possibility that Britain or the UK will be a less desirable destination for writers uh, but maybe not they may feel um, a duty or, or, or a desire to come here because of what's happened politically I and mean, European continental writers may feel more inclined to come here to keep those channels open to keep us interested in aware of what's going on in other European countries. I mean, I, I think it would be, uh, you know, uh, admirable if, 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 if writers saw it in that, in that way. Yeah, it's a perfectly possible uh, development, of course. In in the field of um, academics or universities, uh, the UK have chosen to opt out of the Erasmus program, mm. which is uh, a program that is set up to facilitate the exchange uh, between European countries for university students, most uh, most of all. Uh, this will, of course, means, mean, or can mean at least, that uh, it will be uh, more difficult for generations of UK students to uh, get to know uh, Europe firsthand uh, and uh, long term, not only via tourist uh, visits or, or something like that. Uh, is this being discussed uh, in London and elsewhere in the UK right now? Um, I think it was an afterthought when the, all the other aspects of the Brexit agreement were, were being discussed and being thrashed out at the last minute in the, you know, the 11th hour of the 11th day and uh, then people people raised the, the um, subject of Erasmus and it's almost as if the government hadn't given it any thought or the culture secretary or the education secretary uh, were asleep on, on the job and, they, uh, and so they, they came up with this rather rushed to me it seemed rather rushed idea of having a, a more international, more global um, scheme to enable students to travel and abroad and for other students to come to this country. To leave. But I think they thought they could get away with um, quietly um, leaving the Erasmus scheme. And it's, it's in fact what is happening. In my, I have a personal um, interest in it, that my elder daughter is studying Spanish and she's, well, she should be in a Spanish-speaking country now, but she's not. But she is hoping to get to Granada in Spain in March, and that will be with the assistance of the Erasmus scheme. But this will be the last year in which British students will be able to avail themselves of that fantastic uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, Adrian, I don't want you uh, to leave uh, before asking uh, on a couple of other topical uh, issues. Uh, for example, what we talked about much when we met in uh, Belfast uh, a little yeah. bit over a year ago, uh, and that was the possible breakup of the United Kingdom uh, um, as a consequence of, of Brexit. We see now that the Northern Ireland protocol of the Brexit agreement is being discussed, and for the first time since the since the uh, height of the conflict, uh, border officials are now actually being threatened. Yeah. Uh, uh, not on the island of uh, Ireland, but, but in the Irish Sea. Uh, uh, are, are you discussing this as much as we think that you are? Um, well, it's, it's only a, um, a featuring on the news, and it's um, the, the reports are pretty well every day from Northern Ireland about about this this problem. Um, 
that the threat of border guards is not something which anyone anticipated and it seems a particularly um, unpleasant aspect of it. Um, but the, the more historical threat of the breakup of um, the Union was certainly much discussed before, before uh, uh, the UK left the European Union and that, that seems as, as, as likely a prospect as it's ever been. Uh, not just, obviously, not just Northern Ireland, but it's more, um, more of Scotland. I mean, that's a much more immediate one in the sense that they're having a, they have elections in May and uh, the uh, Scottish National Party uh, uh, predicted to do extremely well. Nicola Sturgeon is very much in the ascendant and she has vowed uh, to um, give the Scottish people a second referendum on independence from the UK. And polls suggest that were that to happen, the majority of Scots this time would, would, would um, vote to leave. Yeah, but there's a lot of uh, on your plate at the moment. Yeah. It's, uh, it's the first uh, first weeks of, of Brexit, even though uh, it will it's still in this uh, kind of intermediary stage. Uh, yeah. And of course, the pandemic. But um, I have to ask you, uh, are you on a schedule to be vaccinated? Vaccinated yet, or no, I'm not, I'm, I haven't heard anything. But uh, I mean, it's, it's of course it's something which um, the the UK government is taking, trying to take as much credit for as they can. But yeah, we are. This country is quite far advanced in its vaccination program. But I mean, I think it's really one has to thank and congratulate the scientists who developed the vaccine. And, um, it's nothing to do with politics. It's just good old fashioned science, isn't it? And it just happens to be that some of the um, vaccines developed have been developed in this country but I mean they're, they're being developed everywhere aren't they and it's just a question of how quickly they can be rolled out but but is there a, 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 an atmosphere of saying well we might have messed up uh, some other things but th this one we got right no, not really I think they've been careful not even the government are careful being careful not to say that but they must probably be tempted. They must, the temptation must be very strong, and I'm sure it will happen. Some cabinet minister will sp sp spill out some self-congratulatory comment sooner or later about it. I mean, in fact, it has happened. The education secretary, Gavin Williamson, made an extremely crass comment that he's, that uh, the Britain was better than other European countries, and that was why Britain was ahead with its vaccination program. And it, I, maybe it was intended as a joke, but it wasn't funny, and it was just extremely stupid. <laughs> Um, yeah. But um, of course, they can use. They can also use the pandemic as an excuse for things that go wrong. I mean, you know, problems at the Irish border are blamed, have been blamed by the Northern Ireland Secretary Brendan Lewis on the pandemic. And I mean, you can't. I mean, it's ridiculous. But I mean, you, what can you say? It's, uh, it's you know, it's it's the, the the unfortunate kind of conjunction of Brexit with the pandemic is. Um, Complicated things. Yeah, complicated to say the least. Yeah. But thank you, Adrian, for giving us insight into what is happening uh, on the former European Union country, oh, uh, the United like Kingdom. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks and uh, stay safe. Thanks very much, Colin. You too. Thank you.